Hello, it's Thursday, February 21st, 2019 at 1 p.m. Eastern Time, and this is Higher Ed Special Edition. I'm your host, Andrea Boyle Tippett from the University of Delaware. Today, we are talking events. Every campus hosts dozens of them every year. And are you taking advantage of those for communications opportunities since they present so many? With us today is a trio of professionals from Georgia Tech. Together, they handle various aspects of communication and event planning. They'll walk us through how they handle commencement. They host seven, yes, seven, yes, seven commencement ceremonies each year. Hopefully, you'll see how, ways that you can adopt those um, tactics that they're using at your own school. Today's Higher Ed Special Edition is part of the Higher Ed Live Network. Episodes offer you direct access to the best and brightest minds in education. We encourage you to join the conversation, share your thoughts and questions with us via Twitter, and we'll discuss them during this hour. Our hashtag is Higher Ed Live. Higher Ed Live is produced by M. Stoner, a digital first agency committed to tailored student solutions that drive real results. Are you a marketing or communications professional who works on your institution's website? M. Stoner's Advanced Marketing for Higher Education course is now available on demand and has something for everyone, especially those of you who wear many hats. You'll walk away better understanding your key audiences, how to create exceptional content with better planning, how to move your website from a capital project to an ongoing process, and more. We'll be tweeting out a link about the on-demand course shortly. All of our Higher Ed Live episodes are free and easy to access in the video archives at higheredlive.com or take it with you on the go by subscribing to the podcast. Today's episode is made possible by PRSA's Counselors to Higher Education Professional Interest Section. Counselors to Higher Ed provides PR professionals working in colleges and universities with publications, insights into the best ways to promote the value, power, and appropriate role of communications and marketing functions within your institutions, and terrific networking opportunities and virtual events like this one. CHE's annual Senior Summit is fast approaching. Be sure to join us in Washington, D.C. for three days of learning in April. There's a jam-packed schedule covering topics from crisis communications and speech writing to what to do when you earn $20 million, or at least your college does. We'll share a link to the registration via Twitter. And now let's chat with today's guests, Kristen Bailey, Serena Wallace, and Bryce Zimmerman. Kristen Bailey serves as Assistant Director of Campus Communications for Institute Communications at the Georgia Institute of Technology, where she's been since 2010. She is an editor of the Institute's two primary campus-wide communications vehicles and works with communicators across campus to bring the most pressing and interesting news of Georgia Tech to students, faculty, and staff each day. She holds a degree in journalism from the University of Georgia's Grady School, I'm sorry, Grady College of Journalism and Mass Communication. Serena Wallace serves as a Senior Events Coordinator in the Office of Special Events and Protocol at Georgia Institute of Technology. She is responsible for the execution of high-level, award-winning, institute-wide events, consultation, and production of training resources. She serves as President of the Events Coordinators Network, a campus network with over 500 faculty and staff with event planning roles or interests. Before coming to Georgia Tech, Serena had experience in nonprofit organizations and social events, she holds a master's degree from Georgia State and is a member of various professional organizations. And finally, as a member of Georgia Tech's social media team and institute communication, Bryce is responsible for creating content for the flagship accounts on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Snapchat. Prior to Georgia Tech, he was the broadcasting director and media relations director for the Fort Myers Miracle, a minor league affiliate of the Minnesota Twins Baseball Club. He was a play-by-play -play announcer for a 140-game schedule and created digital content for the Miracle website and social media. Welcome, Serena, Kristen, and Bryce. Thanks. Hi. <laughs> Thanks. We are so happy to have you all joining us today and to be a part of this webinar where we can share tips and tricks on how we learn to uh, leverage our relationship to work better together and how we apply that to events and hopefully how it can apply to y'all's events. So without further ado, if we want to turn on, yeah, you go. Oh, okay. Sorry, yes. Serena, I'll fire it up. <laughs> we are going to figure this out together. Is it? It's that one. Let's get a check. Share, and let's get this party started. Excellent. And since we already talked about this, we're already 
on slide two. Uh, so <laughs> thank you for that great introduction. A uh, little bit more about our roles and how we all work together and also our contact information. So if you guys have any follow-up questions that we don't get to during the chat, uh, please email us, ask us for templates, questions we, we love to share. So uh, we're unique in that our special events office at Georgia Tech is housed within Institute Communications. We know this isn't the normal setup, but it, it started us talking together and working together much easier, much earlier, because our offices are right next door to each other. Uh, for me and my role, I work on a team of three where we're producing our commencement, convocation, honors luncheons, memorial events, a little bit of everything is what we get in our events office. And if you want to talk about your roles. Yeah, this is Kristen. So I'm on our campus communications team, uh, which basically means I deal with campus news that has anything to do with students, faculty, or staff. Uh, so we produce a daily newsletter that goes out every morning to all of campus. Uh, we have a faculty staff newspaper that comes out every couple weeks, which is sort of a relic in these days. And then uh, also help manage what goes on the Georgia Tech web, uh, the main news website. So curating what's going to pop up there every day and working with the research and other teams that are producing news for that site. I'm Bryce with social media, one of a, a three team, a three member team. Uh, I came to Georgia Tech about two years ago. And up until then, Georgia Tech social media had been run by just one person. We recently hired our third person at the tail end of 2018. So we're kind of building out our, our full team right now in terms of social media. And we work very closely with internal news and special events because so much of what each of them do, we find is very featureable on our social media. So Serena's gonna, I'm Serena, I'm gonna start this <laughs> off, uh, tell you a little bit about our commencement. That our commencement, we see as a great example of our partnership with news and events. So in telling this story of how to partner these things, we think commencement is an easy thing for us to all discuss because we all have one and it's what we exist to do as a university, to graduate our students. Our commencement, we host three in the fall and four in the spring. We have about 3,000 grads in the fall, around 4,000 grads in the spring. So we're seeing a lot of students come through and impacting a lot of our student body during this time. Another great thing about our commencement as we talk through how we work together is it serves as a great testing ground for us. Because there's so much content, so many opportunities, we can try a lot of different things out at our commencement and then scale to our different events. One example you'll see, we get stories about our students. Kristen will talk more about how we get those and decide on which ones to cover. But this was something we could then apply to our retirement dinner. But we're also getting stories about our attendees. Or Commencement Live that Bryce will talk about here in a moment. We would like, that's a great concept for us to engage our audience. So we brought it down to our student convocation, where we also have an audience kind of stuck in the arena as we're waiting to start our show. And so as we're going through things, if you all have questions you want to pose in the chat about how we try to scale things up or down for your university size, please uh, drop us a note. Yeah, and I'll just interject that this kind of all started because we realized it was our 250th commencement a few years back, and we kind of realized, well, Serena took a step from an immense angle at doing things differently, and we wanted to do the same for news. We realized we weren't like, doing much with it. Um, so that's sort of where our partnership started, I guess. Yeah. And or say Bryce anything, we uh, talk more on our next slide. So this began, the game plan started, if you will, yeah, uh, with a large brainstorming session that I pulled together everyone I could in Institute Communications, which also was very helpful because most of our Institute Communications is voluntold to participate in our commencements. So they are familiar with the function, what's going on at this event. And they're also working with different audiences. Maybe they're helping to greet students as they come in for lineup, or maybe they're helping to direct guests to seating locations. So they've seen a lot of sides as well that us as event planners may not get to experience because we're managing other issues that day. But we came together after one of our commencements into a big brainstorm and we said, bring everything you got. No limits, no budgets, what do you want? And we had some great simple ideas of why aren't we putting more in the homepage to crazy ideas of how can a robot pick up grandma from the other side of campus and bring them on over. So we let it all, just had a great session to kind of talk through everything. 
And we also did a lot of benchmarking as well that our campuses, we're all putting our commencement ceremonies out there. It's common for us to live stream. So let's see what everyone else is doing. See how that applies to our students, our culture, our audience. Kristen, do you want to add anything to that? No, uh, I'll expand as we go. Later, I think. <laughs> so from that large brainstorming session, we all walked away and tried to come up with our own goals. And for myself as the event planner, my first goal was to make the main page be commencement that week of. I want there to be no doubt that this ceremony is happening on this campus. Everyone should know this is coming and they should be able to find the information they need to celebrate or if they're coming, where to park. My next goal was to extend the life of the event. We spend months planning this and to have it all happen in 24 hours, we wanna make more bang for our buck. So how can we make this event feel like it's a multi-day experience, even though for each student attending, it's only a two to three hour event. And finally, we wanted folks to get excited. Like I said, this is why we exist as a university, to celebrate our students getting out and getting on to the next big thing that they can create. So we wanted that excitement to build, not only for our students graduating, but for our current undergrad students to be excited about when they graduate and to remind our alumni about how great it was when they got to go across that stage and shake their president's hands. So this is Kristen. From a news perspective, our goals uh, were kind of directly tied to what Serena's were. We realized that we wanted to go beyond the basics of commencement day. So we had kind of made a practice of we would do a news release of who the guest speakers were and how many grads we would have and what time the ceremony was. And that was kind of it. So we realized that we wanted to uh, highlight more about the people who were actually gonna be graduating and faculty and staff to help make it happen. Um, we also wanted, you know, in the same vein, we wanted to celebrate our community and our traditions. It's an old place and we have a lot of traditions and people are very into them. And we have a lot of people who, or a lot of students whose families went to Georgia Tech, who are legacy students, or maybe had a brother or sister that went here. So we wanted to kind of connect people back to, you know, why they love Georgia Tech and bring up that nostalgia angle at times. And finally, in the same vein, we wanted commencement to be special for everyone there. So we have a lot of faculty and staff who volunteer, like Serena said, and they go to commencement every semester. So we don't want it to be boring for them. We want them to be excited too. And then we want every graduate to have a really special day. And so we wanna make sure that that is the case for people as they're entering into commencement week. So as Serena and Kristen have, have mentioned, and we all know working in higher education, just how important commencement is and from a social media standpoint, of course, we, we saw that in very, very different avenues. And one of the things that we wanted to do in terms of creating a social plan for commencement was create some engaging content that can do double duty for us. We had this idea, and we're going to talk about it a little bit later, about what Commencement Live is and how that came into being. But we also wanted to put together a full plan from leading up to commencement to a few days afterwards and creating content that we can use in multiple places and against multiple platforms. All the content and videos that we put together for Commencement Live, which is a te television style live broadcast that airs pre the commencement ceremony, we try to use production methods like certain time constraints, uh, keeping under 120 seconds, leading with our best imagery, those types of production methods that we know enhance engagement on social media. Our next goal is one of the top engineering schools in the world and with a campus renowned for attracting students with an innovative nature, we're using commencement as an opportunity to share those exciting and unique stories and really fall in line with our brand identity as Georgia Tech. How can we promote some of the, the amazing, fantastic things that our students are doing and generate that excitement throughout the entirety of our audience and all of our social platforms? Another goal that we wanted to have is that when people enter the arena uh, at McCamish Pavilion, which is the basketball arena here at Georgia Tech where commencement is held, we know that we have a captive audience that is ready to engage in the festivities of the day. Commencement Live was this opportunity to kick off the ceremony by capitalizing on what would normally be dead or silent time or inactive time prior to the processional. So that was one of our key goals. And finally, we're fortunate enough to have multiple people here on staff that had experience in some live broadcasting and television production. So our goal was to create a live experience that was comparable to what you might see 
on a television style quality broadcast. And we'll show you some of that a little bit later on. So using all these different goals and ideas and everything we want to accomplish, we're lucky that it all came together into one list that we could all focus on and work on together. So we all wanted to interact with a wider community. We all wanted to actively curate our pre-show and engage our guests in the 90 minutes prior to ceremony start. We wanted homepage to reflect that it's commencement by having more content. And we want to create commencement related features that lead up to the ceremony, not just celebrate on the day of the ceremony. And to that measure, we will now show you how we play ball. So I'll give you a few examples of how this has played out for us recently. Uh, these are a couple of stories that we produced for our fall commencement this past semester. And the way these came about was actually through a partnership with Serena. So one of the things that she does, uh, our commencements are ticketed because they're in a basketball arena. We have a limited number of how many guests each student can bring. So Serena and her team start communicating with graduates at the beginning of the semester and sending them an email that says, you need to RSVP for commencement if you're going to come so that she can start getting counts of how many tickets go out and who's going to be there. So what we've started doing is piggybacking on that by including a short link or a link to a short survey that is just a Google survey that says, if you want to tell us more about why you're excited about commencement, do that here. It basically asks, you know, your name, your major, where you're from, what you're excited about, what's something that you're going to miss about Georgia Tech. We ask a couple of other things if we're looking for different types of stories. There was one semester we wanted to try to do something on first-gen students, so we threw a question in that said, are you a first-generation student? So just, you know, maybe five or six questions, we keep it short, and that is kind of how we initially start gathering stories from those students that are going to be graduating that semester. So we've actually already done that this semester, and the numbers continue to go up. Last semester, we got a total of 22. This semester, we've already got 24, and we haven't even started doing any actual commencement outreach or anything yet. Um, so that's been very effective. These two students both came from that, and the first one was a young man who uh, he left Georgia Tech because he had substance abuse issues, and he came back and his goal was to get his bachelor's degree before he was 30, and he managed to do it in the fall when he was 29. So we were able to go interview him and take some nice photos and put together an audio slideshow where he kind of talked about, you know, his own struggles and was very encouraging to other students who might have been experiencing similar challenges. And then the guy on the right, Ignacio, he uh, was training to be a fighter pilot and was in a motorcycle accident and was injured and paralyzed. And he now is a graduate of our biomedical uh, bio design program where he is creating prosthetics to help other people who have similar paralysis. So uh, Bryce and his colleagues actually got together and did video with him. And uh, we put together a feature package. And obviously, that's an example of it being on social media as well. Um, you want to yeah, about that? In these meetings where we're talking about these students and going through these surveys, we're able to pick through the submissions and really identify what works best for each of us in our different apartments. Uh, with Kristen and Andrew's story with the substance abuse, that wasn't something that we felt necessarily comfortable promoting on social media, but it did very well in a web format and in an internal news. For Ignacio, I'm going to talk about him in just a little bit uh, in some of the impact with what that story did for us in real time during commencement, which was really cool. But uh, these, these meetings also allowed us to break up some of the responsibilities and the content production and build stories through multiple forms of multimedia. For the social media side, a, a lot of times we focus on creating video content, uh, but we have a stable of photographers and writers that do fantastic things that Kristen works with intimately. So we can build to the these features that come together through you know four, five, six people working on them, different content pieces, throwing them together. We've got a place for them on the website. It's kind of their home, but then we can also pick different parts of them, different content items that we think will work specifically for social and use those to promote those stories. By creating these pieces prior to commencement too, we also know the stories intimately and we can figure out how to best place these stories when we're leading up to the event and also within commencement live. And what I mean by that is we know when to place them as far as leading up to commencement to drive some excitement coming up to the day on the day of in order to get eyeballs onto our social media that will help us generate more content throughout the day that increases our engagement. And post, once the event is over, going into those really slow weeks in December or in May, where you don't have a lot of content being generated, we can continue to tell the story of Georgia Tech for days afterwards. And for instance, Ignacio is a great story. 
Kristen talked about him. I mean, he's a young man. He left Cuba at the age of four. His father won a green card lottery. He comes here. His, his mother had passed away when he was still in Cuba. He, he's going to be a fighter pilot, gets paralyzed, and has this life-altering injury, but it puts him on a different path, and really a path that we feel is in line with Georgia Tech's brand identity and what we think that, that Georgia Tech uh, can do for someone and what they can do for Georgia Tech as well. And we ended up interviewing Ignacio as part of Commencement Live at the very end of the master's ceremony. And it was important that we put him at the end for multiple reasons. It was important for Serena yes. because he was in a motorized wheelchair. And so she had to think about the logistics of how to get him from the staging area all the way down to the floor and still have him have the same commencement experience that he would also have with his fellow students. But it was important for us too, because this was this was kind of our reveal. I mean, this was our big story. This is our biggest triumph that we had. And by interviewing him at the time before he went down, he actually got a, an ovation, a standing ovation that he didn't even know about back in the freshman gymnasium where he was staging. He had no clue that that was going on. He got an ovation. And then during the commencement ceremony, when he used his motorized wheelchair to move across the stage, and, uh, and also our president in, and actually had mentioned him <laughs> in the speech as well. So he received another standing ovation <laughs> that he experienced that was probably close to a minute long that just created this really special effect for not just the people there, but the people watching online. And it kind of brought it all together uh, with this really symbiotic approach of how we create content to how that can impact our audience in many different ways, whether that's in real time or later on consuming through social media. So that was a really, uh, important piece that we did that we felt connected on so many different levels and showed exactly the power of what you can do by enhancing your your engaging content for commencement. Yeah, there's normally <coughs> one or two students who will see, based on the coverage that Bryce or Kristen has done, they're getting an extra applause or a standing ovation at ceremony. And that's another clue to us that they are engaged with these pieces, they are connecting with these pieces, and they're still paying attention when we're on name 1,203, they're still paying attention to what's going across the stage. So that's a good sign for us. And when you're talking with your event planners about how to get in their emails or get these links sent out, you know, we're using MailChimp, so we know exactly which emails they're clicking on. They're clicking on the RSVP email. They're clicking on the ticket email. So we're making sure to place a link in those top red emails that are getting something ridiculous, like a 70% open rate, that's the email we're putting the link for Kristen's Google form to try to generate those story content, which is also great for us because it's early in the semester. So when you're working, go to the next slide. So when we're talking with your event planners, when you're talking with them, you know, ask them what they're sending out to their students. Ask them how they're connecting with this group because they're sending them something and that's a great opportunity for you to get this information. So Ignacio's story is awesome. Y'all should, I think that the link has been tweeted out by now, but if not, you can go find it on our news site um, or on our social media posts or on our YouTube channel. So I'm gonna talk about one that's a little more lighthearted that we started a few years ago. And basically this became a thing because of this guy who's our provost who wears regalia that is interesting we'll say and people asked about the ruffle what does it mean why does he look different so we took it as an opportunity to talk about regalia and what it is and why we wear it because most students just know they got to go get it from the bookstore but they probably don't really think about why they wear the mortarboard or their gown and so we did a feature where we took photos that were sort of Vogue stylized fashion shoots with all of our deans and our president and our provost and just highlighted their regalia. And it was another fun thing to do during commencement week. It also was a chance for students to make sure they know what their regalia looks like. And you know, if they're gonna borrow one from a friend who graduated three years ago, maybe make sure it looks the same because it might not. <laughs> <laughs> like this semester, so. Um, yeah, we're changing, you know, a minor color feature on the regalia. So we were gonna, we're gonna reshoot photos this semester with new ones. And we actually have updated this. We've had a couple of deans switch out. So we've taken new photos with new deans and we're gonna kind of do a second iteration of this this spring where we take pictures and do something similar with faculty who attend commencement a lot and have interesting regalia, but aren't necessarily a dean or you know a executive level type person, but just someone who has colorful regalia, because it's one of those things about the ceremony that's fun and we want to kind of call out. It's kind of like, if you remember, for the creation of this type of content, 
it, it's kind of like, I think it was NBC. Like if you haven't seen it, it's new to you. Mm -hmm. You know, it's important to note that every commencement cycle has a brand new audience, uh, both on the live broadcast, on social, coming through the web hits. And it, that's the advantage of cyclical and repetitive events for college campuses. Yes, we do seven commencements and that may seem to uh, get monotonous and it may seem to be kind of the same thing when you do 14 or 21 commencements in two or three years, but you have the opportunity to freshen and spice it up some of the content items every so often and they still perform remarkably well because the perspective of the audience has changed ideally from prospective student to current student to graduate to alumni and the perspective of parents has changed throughout that time as well of these current and future alumni so it's just something to think about that if you're kind of tired of the messaging that you've had you can just repurpose it in a different way and come up with a new story angle this is one that we've also seen our deans share on their personal Facebook pages because they like seeing themselves in fancy photos. <laughs> <laughs> or content share, we love it. That's right. Uh, so this is an example, this is our daily newsletter that I manage. And basically we're at a point now where we create enough stories that are tied to commencement that basically that whole week it's commencement loaded, uh, which Serena loves from a <laughs> professional standpoint. But I also think, you know, it's the, at that point finals are over or winding down there's really not anything else going on on campus besides maybe athletic events and faculty related stuff so why not blow out commencement and talk about it all week long and so we're able to kind of time you know earlier on we'll do stories that are a little more logistics focused and then as we progress we start telling the profile stories that we've already kind of discussed uh so these are a couple examples of that practical content that we do this is something that arose out of a need when we had a lot of construction on campus and one of our main landmark buildings, Tech Tower, it's our original building on campus. It was roped off or fenced off for over a year being renovated. And at the same time, our little historical marker around the corner was also fenced off and campus was just kind of torn up. So we took it as an opportunity to showcase where are some other places you might take your graduation photos because you can't take it in the place that most people would like to. So it was a chance to showcase the prettier places on campus. We're in the middle of downtown Atlanta, so we have nice skyline views depending on where you go. So we also now have updated it. Our buildings are back open, which is great. And uh, we've added some of those in. We Usually what I do now is go to social media, find students who have already taken their grad pictures, highlight a few of them, which is what you see kind of in the top part of that feature. And then down below, which you can't see, our staff photographer actually offers tips to amateurs of kind of how to light your pictures or where to stand to get the best shot, that kind of thing. So this is something we run early on in the commencement season, maybe a couple weeks out. And then uh, this is another piece that has come out of a practical need that I'll kind of let Serena talk about the need for this. So this piece is called What Not to Wear Commencement Edition. And we were running into a lot of issues with our students bringing oversized bags to line up. Everything they bring, they have to bring into the ceremony. And some students were bringing their luggage to catch flights afterwards, laptops, large purses, large bags. And we couldn't have that in there. And it was causing students to be late. We had no storage and our security team was having a lot of issues with it. So they came to us and asked us, how can we communicate this different? And I'm not a communicator, I'm an event planner and being housed in instant communications, went talk to the news team and said, how do we do this? What's a good way? And that's where what not to wear came from. It allowed us to focus on what they should do more than what they shouldn't do, but also mentioning what they shouldn't do. And this year we're moving to a clear bag policy in our venue. So this will be a very important piece for us to discuss what not to wear, what not to bring, how to prepare, and a little bit for their guests as well. And yeah, so and this, I mean, it, it was born out of a need, but it has been our most traffic news item on our website for years now. And it's probably because people Google what to wear to commencement from many of your institutions and they show up here. So it has been one that we put the effort into once. Now we just look at it every semester, update it if we need to. Like Serena said, this year we'll have to approach clear bags and talk about that. Uh, but it gets highly trafficked because like Bryce said, there's a new audience every semester. They need to know what they're doing and they're not staying, they're not getting that glued into the minutia of commencement until they're actually going to graduate. And we do know they're reading it and they're looking at this because we saw a significant impact in our commencement ceremonies. I do not have luggage coming anymore. We have much more sensible shoe choices coming. <laughs> we saw way less bags, way less issues. So we know they're reading it and that this was the best format because even though it was on our commencement website, it wasn't getting the attention that this news piece gave it. 
from a social standpoint, we totally piggyback off of everything Kristen does <laughs> and, and, the, and the internal news team. So uh, the way that our timeline works is as Kristen is kind of pumping out some of this content early on, we're still uh, in a phase on our day-to-day -day actions where a lot of students are going through finals. They're, you know, if we're two to three out, weeks out from graduation, there's still a lot of school left to be told. And with the shelf life of social media, not quite as long as what you put on the web, we're still focusing on that type of content production, at least from what we're posting. But about two to three weeks out, we do start scheduling video interviews with who are gonna be our subjects for Commencement Live. And we start thinking about the content that we want our entire rundown for Commencement Live. And we use that a lot with our social. And then we slowly start to leak out some of the stories uh, the week or so leading up to Commencement. We often cross promote and coordinate uh, with Kristen's Daily Digest and the internal news content and make sure that we're um, putting that out as well. Specifically, we find the most engaging content like what not to wear, that's probably gonna go out on Facebook, but some of the other smaller items we'll put out on Twitter. Uh, we'll find ways to link to them on Instagram through Instagram stories, but we'll, we'll kind of hold back on Facebook except for our, you know, kind of our key items that we wanna focus on that week, whether it's informational, whether it's to help out uh, with, with sending out information so it helps Serena and students know what they're doing on commencement day, or if it's also a story that we want to promote leading up to commencement. And this really allows us to utilize the stories for commencement on the front and back side of the event uh, in addition to the day of. All right. That's keep, live. Go for it. All right, keep rolling. <laughs> commencement live. So basically what commencement live is, and we haven't necessarily shown you this yet, yet is commencement live is a one hour pre-show that we do live inside McCamish Pavilion, the basketball arena where commencement is held. And we do it as a television style broadcast. And we will line up students to talk to. We have featured content packages, video packages that we will preload into, um, into the uh, infrastructure, the video in infrastructure that they put in at McCamish Pavilion. And we can use those to play and entertain the audience for an hour. And basically, this was born out of one of those meetings. And Serena, I know you, I wasn't here when Commencement Live oh, started, that's right. but I know you were. And it was just kind of this idea that popped up as we've got a couple thousand people out there doing nothing for an hour. We do, we, and we're in a basketball arena. We were tired of fighting being in a basketball arena. I'm watching them get churros and deliver them to their students on the floor. So why am I <laughs> denying our, what what we are? and and like Bryce said, we had the infrastructure there. They have the cameras, they have the experience, and and it was a little work talking with our athletics department and, and getting them on board and, and letting them know this potential, but they weren't doing very much during that hour and a half either. So in talking with it, we realized we had such talent on our social media team and our news team that we were not taking advantage of. We were able to supply them with our RSVP list so they could get an idea of which students were coming that they already had packages made on and how they can maximize that during that 90 minute pre-show. So as Serena mentions, we, we do a chunk of videos in the weeks leading up to commencement and that's that's always a burden. I mean, we've got about 10, 10 to 15 work days to try and schedule eight or nine interviews per commencement uh, that we wanna make sure that we've got loaded up, ready to roll on that day. But we also cross reference those graduation lists with some of the stories we've done, not just from the last year, but years. Yeah. I mean, sometimes we've talked to freshmen in their first year and they roll around for commencement four or five years later. And it's fun to catch up. And this was them as a freshman. This is what they're doing now. And what we'll do is we'll play the package, the video package. And then when we come back to the live camera, and you can kind of see in the picture on the, on the slide right now, that is director of social media here at at Georgia Tech, Stephen Norris, interviewing someone that we have already rolled a package for. So we've introduced them, now we catch up to them, we do a, a quick two questions. We've tried to cut that down, it used to be three or four, <laughs> but uh, we found the faster we move that the, the audience stays engaged longer. So we'll do a quick couple questions with them live and we move on to the next one. We try to get about half of our show content in each ceremony from already created stories and then go out and get the rest of it uh, with those surveys that, that have been filled out a couple of weeks before. Additionally, we also have some evergreen and recent news content to give a fresh and different look to the broadcast. So every now and again, if we've done something really remarkably in research, we'll play that. We'll try to roll that into someone who is maybe a major. So if we're doing uh, something on bio and nuclear engineering, 
we might have biomolecular and nuclear engineering. We might have a story that correlates to that or research that's been done at Georgia Tech. And that just helps us break it up from being face, 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 face. And also, you know, it spreads the message of all the great things that we're doing as an institution. As, and, and one other thing, if you're needing to sell this to your event planner and, and kind of give them the perks, another perk that we get out of it is our parents, our number one question commencement day is, where is my student seated? How are they going across stage? All these these things they want to know. And we put up, once again, we put on our website, but they're not paying attention. But they are paying attention when Bryce is walking the floor five minutes before ceremony start, pointing it out, saying which colleges are coming out of which doors, walking them through how they're going to go across stage. So it's a great chance for us to share the logistics with our audience. And it's another opportunity, if we want to be prepared, to go through emergency procedures. Like they are paying attention to these guys on the floor. So we get to reinforce our message one more time in an engaging way. And we were able to in that moment. Uh, so what ends up happening is the picture you see here, that is a uh, live video from behind the scenes. But about five minutes before the ceremony is actually about to start, we go down to the floor out in front of the crowd. And that's what Serena is talking about, where we can engage that crowd and we can kind of show them physically where their student, at least a range of where their student is, and then also not land a couple of jokes. <laughs> uh, just about every year, some of those some of those jokes don't land. We appreciate that. All right. So here's a quick look uh, of what Facebook Live looks like. Um, I'm not in this video, so I guess we'll watch it anyway. But uh, <laughs> Jason Mater, who's now at Carnegie Mellon, and Stephen Norris are the hosts of Commencement Live. And this is uh, just a quick recap. We'll show just a minute or so of this so you can get an idea of what this live show looks like. Let me see if that actually should work. It should work. And yet... We're not getting the content. All right, you want to cut over there? Yeah, I can. Try it. Can you try hitting the mute. While you all are doing that, okay. while you're pulling it up, I will um, mention to everyone. Oh, there, oh, there it is. It is. Sorry. Yep. Oh, you want to go ahead, Andrew? You want to play? Um, one, yeah, one second. I'll just let everyone know if they, um, if they do have any questions that you can tweet and using the hashtag Higher Ed Live, and we'll answer those questions after you wrap up your presentation. Thanks. All right, let's see if this works. Hey. It is our purpose over the next hour to kind of bring you behind the scenes and show you what it's like to put on commencement and also to interview some of these students. Commencement live is what we call this. I've talked about a little bit what we're going to do. You talk to a lot of students as social media coordinator here at Georgia Tech. What are the feelings from them about commencement? You know, I think commencement is a really exciting time. It's kind of the culmination of all the hard work that you've put in here at Georgia Tech. Our first interview is going to be with someone who took on a very male-dominated field, uh, finished her master's as uh, a mother. So take a look at this video. I chose building construction at Georgia Tech because it had strong credibility within an industry that I'm a part of. You're in a field that is... Uh, predominantly male dominated. And so what has it been like taking on uh, that major? It's been very uh, interesting. I've learned a lot. Welcome back to the Zelnack Center. I love the announcements. So what they're doing is they're telling students, if you've just arrived, go find your name on the sheets over here, get yourself a name yeah, yeah. card, yeah, fill that, that thing out, and then it's... So what Jason is doing right there is something that we end up doing a lot of. Though this has been scripted down to the minute, we also recognize that it's a live show and there's a lot of different energy that you encounter during an hour leading up to commencement. And we'll mix in just on the spot interviews. We'll pull people that have interesting mortar boards or regalia and we'll bring them in and we'll just do it on the spot, spontaneous style interviews. And that really adds a lot to the show and keeps it from just becoming, here's video, here's interview. Here's video, here's interview. Uh, here's a promotional video for Georgia Tech. You know, that brings the energy and, and really kind of pulls everybody together in this idea that this is an event that's happening right now. That's the live. That's the live part of it. Uh, that's probably enough for y'all to get a taste of it, but that's obviously on YouTube if you want to see more, or if you want to just go back and, do we have those on YouTube, like the full versions? Of, mm -hmm. yes, I thought so. Yes, we do. If you really want to sit through an hour of Commencement Live, it's all on our <laughs> YouTube channel. All right. Serena. <laughs> so now that you've seen how it kind of works in practice, practice. We want to walk you through what we're doing today and how it's all come together. So our coverage is now beginning much, much earlier. Instead of, like I said, doing two or three days out, we're starting to trickle that stuff out about three weeks out, which is great. On event day, we own gotech.edu. You know it's commencement 
And on the events team, we love it because we've seen our call volume go down, our web traffic to pages like parking and tickets and those logistic pages go up. And our guests have a much better idea of what seems to be going on that day. So we know that they're paying attention to this content because we're able to focus more on the event. And that's thanks to our news team and what they've put out there to build excitement. And whether they're coming because they were interested in finding parking or because they saw a great story about one of our students and that led them to find out more about the ceremony logistics. It's all a win to us. And from a news perspective, I mean, these are some of our most popular stories all year long. Uh, these are just some quick stats for 2018. So like I said, what not to wear is the number one story on our whole news site for the year, which is kind of silly, but people need to know, I guess. And uh, the bringing down the cap and gown I talked about was our number six story for the whole year. That one, we kind of have hit a pattern of we run it once a year. We don't run it every semester because we don't want people to get too bored and, you know, things change. Sometimes you got to we have an interim dean right now, for example, so we're just going to kind of hold it till another semester when people are in place. Um, and then within our feature stories, so we put out obviously a lot of just general news releases on all kinds of stuff. And then we do a lot of different features as well, which includes some research, student life, all kinds of stuff. But for the year, the cap and gown one was number two, which we produced four years ago now. And then I didn't talk about this, but Another feature we did celebrating small was number six, which I think that we actually did that in spring 2018. Sorry for the typo. But this is a story about how our grads can get a wallet sized version of their diploma when they graduate. So they just have to tell the alumni association that they want it. And if you've already graduated and you want one or you lost one, you can get it for, I forget, it's 10 or $20. But we did a little story on a student who he got two degrees and he moved around a lot right after college. So he framed his little wallet sized diplomas because it was easier than framing his big ones. And that one's been popular, I think, because it's practical and because it's kind of a unique element of commencement. Um, but obviously it kind of shows that these stories have staying power. So they stick around in our stats all year long and it's worth the time we invest to create them because people are reading them at a high rate. From a social perspective, these are some of our numbers regarding all of our commencement content. Uh, and that includes from posting before the event to day of to the week or two afterwards, where we'll cycle out some of those graduation stories. The numbers, uh, Good numbers, over 2.2 million impressions across our flagship social media. That is primarily Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And you can see the numbers uh, of unique social media video views. I wanna take a guess here and say that for our last commencement, we probably did about 10 to 12 videos that were put out uh, primarily as commencement content, not including some of the videos that we played during commencement live. So, um, you know, which does factor in as well. Live stream generating over 775,000 impressions uh, over the three ceremonies. And, you know, if you think about that impression number over the three ceremonies and over maybe a week or two, I mean, that's a lot of eyeballs and a lot of um, feeds that you're getting into, you know, that are seeing the primary logo of Georgia Tech, seeing the primary colors of Georgia Tech, recognizing that this is the flagship account of Georgia Tech. Uh, and then it's also a lot of shareable content for all of our campus units, the, the different colleges and schools that we have here on campus that have their own social media accounts. And then direct engagements. This is something that we've seen increase uh, lately, specifically with Instagram, but uh, almost 28,000 direct engagements, like shares, retweets, and particularly comments, creating conversations and then continuing those conversations uh, as we continue to shed light on some of the great things that are happening at Georgia Tech. So for, from a social media standpoint, uh, Commencement Live has been fantastic, but just the overall thought process of let's build almost a commencement season over a couple of weeks has been tremendously successful. And it's actually been great timing for us from internal news perspective to, to work with the social media team. Because what happens is, like Bryce said, they spend those couple weeks before commencement putting together a bunch of short videos about grads that they're gonna put as part of the commencement live reel and then go talk to them in person. And what happens is a lot of those we end up putting up as news stories after commencement. So the week after, Bryce said he borrows a lot from me before, I borrow a lot from them after because that's when a lot of those commencement live stories, after they've kind of debuted at the ceremony, we end up putting them, they're already on YouTube, but we put them in our news site as well. And then we can tease to them again to kind of continue celebrating the season. 
And this is how you really measure success is if you can get the president to cry, which we did a few years ago. We were proud of that with one of our more heart-wrenching stories. <laughs> so now we're trying to do it every semester. Um, so looking ahead, what do we do now? We still, like Serena talked about earlier, we still start with a brainstorm. We try to have a good group of folks, including the three of us, our other events and social media people, other writers, photographers, um, you know, just people who will know things, you know, they can, different people can come up with different ideas of how to approach a story. And the <laughs> events team obviously knows things like landmark anniversaries, if it's, you know, the 50th anniversary of when we first graduated uh, female students or something like that. Um, and that's when they can kind of start telling us some of those people they know are coming through graduation, we can do the same. Uh, we look at what we can reuse. So stuff, like I said, like our regalia piece, we go back and see what did we do that we can just spruce up a little for this semester. Uh, or maybe there are stories we didn't get to that we thought would be a good idea, but we couldn't find the right sources for it. Maybe this semester we can find a trend that we thought would have been interesting and now it's the right people have come along to highlight it. And then we all keep the same audiences in mind, I think, for the three of us, regardless of what it is we're doing. So if you're looking to start this on your campus, well, one, start with volunteering, I think, your department. But uh, <laughs> also start with that that brainstorm session. We got so much out of it. There's so much talent on, and on I know our that team. sounds silly. We, it we make it fun. Okay. We bring food. It's like an hour. You don't leave with an assignment. We just talk about what we know is going on. And we do it early in the semester, so there's not stress associated with it. And I think if, if anything, what it will do is, well, it, if you're, you know, you know, we all, we're working, we're not all lottery winners here and doing this for fun. So yeah, everybody gets kind of down in their job sometimes. This will revitalize and, and kind of recenter your purpose of why you're doing what you're doing, because you really are picking like the best stories and the most positive stories and the, the successes and the triumphs of the students. And it gives you just kind of this refreshing purpose uh, for being at Georgia Tech. Specifically, I know on the social media side, you know, almost all of what we do is positive. And of course, from internal news and events, we're trying to create positive experiences. But, you know, over the course of a semester, there are things that happen that you have to report on, that you have to send out. And this is just one of those moments in time where everybody is excited for the future and the possibilities that are ahead. And I think it's a good time when you get together in those brainstorming sessions, we get kind of a head start. We're like four weeks ahead. We're pepped up on on uh, all the commencement stories around the office, and it doesn't feel as much like work. That's right. And and you know, I'm going to say, Bryce, you can talk about how we don't need a lot of camera. Like we're we're lucky to be in a venue that has it, but a cell phone and Facebook Live could do this too, right? Yeah, I mean, so if you happen to have come across Georgia Tech and what we do in our social media feeds, we do a lot of Facebook Lives. Um, one of the reasons why we do that is because the engagement is good and we have a very active and engaged uh, audience base, but also because the technology is really accessible. Um, we use our cell phones to do all of our Facebook Lives. And while you may not be able to do a commencement live where it streams through whatever your arena you're in, say your institution doesn't, uh, it's not your home institute or you can't get the athletic convention department on board or convention center. Uh, you can find ways to still do things on your social media channels that mimic what we do for Commencement Live and engage the audience that can't be there, the grandmothers that can't be there, the grandfathers, the uncles, the aunts, the best friends. You can find ways to get them involved and you can actually be much more interactive on social media. So during your Facebook Lives, you can have someone who is shooting, someone who is on camera. If you can find someone comfortable enough, you can set up four or five interviews, do a 30 minute show. And then you can also, if you have enough people around, you can have someone that stands back and comments back and interacts with the students or with interacts with the audience in real time. And those are ways just to do something a little bit different, to give a behind the scenes look and start off your own live. And if you see and find success with that, maybe you can, gen uh, you can venture into something like what we do for commencement live where you have the infrastructure in place. But even if we didn't have the infrastructure, I think we'd still be looking at finding ways to engage that audience that's there, but also making sure that we're building up to commencement on a social platform. I mean, this year or this past semester, I remember uh, we had enough manpower, the social media team now to do a little bit more man on the street. And that's something everyone's familiar with that format. It's easy for a guest or a student to kind of jump in. But I remember Bryce being in the crowds, looking for those families that had the crazy t-shirts, the largest signs, even though they weren't supposed to bring them in, but that's okay. And <laughs> seeing what we can do to get the audience excited about their students as well. And, and finding different ways for us to do things that an audience can relate to, 
can understand quickly and engage with on, in the moment. And we don't have a slide for this, but this question almost always comes in is like, what equipment do I need aside from a cell phone? There are, there are plenty of ways that you can um, get cell phone audio from your cell phone into a wireless device where you're using a handheld microphone. So you can look that up. It's very basic, just cell phone, you know, how to get audio from my cell phone from a microphone and Google that. There's an app called Switcher Studio that will actually allow you, and there are some other third-party apps as well that will actually allow you to put in B-roll video where you can play videos during your live broadcast or you can put up graphics so you can make it look like a more presentable presentation. And then also, if you want to make sure that you have a steady shot, you have a good camera, there are gimbals, which are these stabilizing devices that you can use for your cell phone that will stabilize your shot so you're not bouncing and shaky all over the place. So there are tools out there available. All of those tools are relatively inexpensive. The most expensive one might be uh, the gimbal for $100, $125, depending on which type of product you go for. So if you have any questions on that sort of stuff, feel free to email me. That's up there, and we can get you set up with some of the types of equipment that we use. We don't endorse any equipment uh, <laughs> We're specifically from Georgia Tech, <laughs> but uh, there's certainly some out there that are very easy just knowing those terms that you can find in an affordable rate. Bryce, when you're talking about um, resources, I was thinking more also about who could you tap on campus? Um, can you talk about, you know, maybe if you have a smaller team, who you might want to tap to get involved um, manpower-wise? I'm also thinking about the fact that it's a little bit difficult, um, as I find doing this webinar, to host something live, right? So for somebody who might have a certain skill set, do you go to, is there suggestions of maybe who you might go to to look for someone with that sort of skill set as well? Sure. I, I think a lot of times now, especially within communications, I'm a great example of this, and, and a lot of people are in our department uh, that have backgrounds in broadcasting, that have backgrounds being in front of a camera or being behind a camera. So that's like the first thing that you can do is reach out to the communicators that you know on campus and see if you can find someone that has a background, that has an interest, that has a passion, that might be uh, want, want to be part of your crew. Um, <laughs> then the next thing that you can do is- I would even interject to that. We don't have like a journalism school or a broadcast school, mm -hmm. but some of you might be at universities where you have faculty who have that expertise if you don't. So mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, students, like we don't have as much of that, so we have to rely on our staff, but you could have different options. I was even thinking about if you have a theater department, you might be able to find somebody who at least yeah. has green presence. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. We uh, so and then the other thing that we do as a social media team is we employ, you know, five or six students each semester. Most of them are taking photography, but as the course uh, or are taking our, our photos, but as the course of the year goes on, we try to kind of school them up on some of the skills, being comfortable, uh, you know, hosting some Instagram lives or doing Instagram stories where they're putting their face on camera. And you can kind of train them up to the point where maybe in the future you might have a little workforce there for a couple of years, a couple of semesters, where you might be able to use them and, and be comfortable with the type of work that they might be doing to represent your institution. You can also look at, uh, it's, certainly, it's certainly conceivable that you might have a creative services team or a video team at your institute that might have at least the equipment that you could use, if not the manpower, if they can't dedicate it to, but certainly worth asking the question, I want to start something that's a live broadcast. You know, what do I need to do? And do you have the manpower or the person power to be able to help us? And that leads right to a question that we came that came in from Twitter. They were asking um, who does who shoots and edits the pre-recorded videos that you use? Um, is it your video team, is it social media team? And then also suggestions for people who might not have the same sort of resources. Well, I think that's a fantastic question. And really what we do have kind of a collaborative effort. Some of the videos, especially the evergreen content or some of the, the videos that we'll post uh, throughout the year that may come from research videos or uh, you know, trying to identify key themes that we wanna represent Georgia Tech. We can pull those a lot of times from the video team. Uh, we do have a video department here in our Institute Communications that's housed and, and we can get in contact with them and make sure that we have those assets. But as far as the student interviews go, and even some cases, the student stories, a lot of those, uh, almost all of them, are being produced by myself and the social media team. Uh, in the past, we have had members of our news team that were certainly capable uh, of doing those types of videos. But uh, as of right now, there are only three of us in the social media team that are, that are doing videos, but we are creating them ourselves. Okay. Another question that came in is, how or is the alumni association involved? Our 
Alumni Association is, is separate from us. So they are working with the events office from how to get in contact with students. They're doing their own set of events. Uh, they're not as involved in the day of commencement as they may be at other institutions because to us, they're a separate entity. And I guess, they, go ahead. Oh, I was gonna say, I mean, for us from a story, from a story and video perspective, since we're focused on current students, we don't end up have, like they don't have as much of a connection as they would if we were looking for grads. Um, yeah, what were you going to say, Andrea? I was just thinking that they probably can piggyback a lot, you know, depending on the situation with the with the organizations. But um, you know, they might be able to repurpose, particularly a lot of the social content. But also, probably, you know, if they run their own websites, they might be able to partner with teams like yours to repurpose the content that you're putting on your your channels there as well. Yeah, I think I've seen some of that on social media in particular. Yeah, our, our alumni is um, our alumni association is very active on Instagram, and uh, they tend to take uh, some of the the better pictures that we use and repurpose them on their platforms. And sometimes too, even they'll have some decent stuff that they've created on their own that we can piggyback off of as well. So that's just the symbiotic relationship of, of social media that makes sense. You know, when you see it, you can go ahead and grab it, and, and we encourage our campus units and alumni association and people connected to you know use our content as they see fit on their own channels. And I should add for my purposes for the our campus newsletter, a lot of times I will kind of pocket away stories that they have in their alumni magazine or on their website that are about alumni. And then the week of commencement, sometimes I'll kind of sprinkle in grad grad stories because those students are about to be alumni. So it's sort of like this could be you in 20 years and you could be in the alumni magazine, or you could be doing this great thing. So there is some of that, even though it's not specifically tied to commencement or the event itself. Sure, that's great. That makes that makes complete sense. Um, with the stories about the current students, of the graduating students, I know this might be like a blue sky question, right? Like you might, you said you have 20 something entries. I know you've had 20 something entries for this semester so far. So you have a number to choose from, but not a monstrous number to choose from, right? How do you, choose which stories you are going to include. Um, do you benchmark them against your, you know, brand goals? What are what are the ways you choose? Yeah, and I should add that those submissions are really just one way that we get students because usually Bryce or Steven will do something on social media asking about stories too. And we also just know some students because like Bryce said, we've done stories on them in the past. So that's kind of what we do at that initial meeting when we all get together together is bring kind of everything we know, look at trying to get a good diversity of majors. We're a very heavy engineering school, so we don't want to just do stories about engineers. We want to make sure that we're getting all six of our colleges and different types of students from different backgrounds. And then, yeah, there is some of that kind of looking against our brand. I mean, this past semester, we actually did a really good story about a student who had founded her own company and entrepreneurship is a very big deal at Georgia Tech, um, along with makerspaces. And I know that's kind of a thing everywhere now, but we had a nice story about a grad um, that tied back to that in particular. You want to expand yeah, on that? And then another thing that we'll do is we'll try and identify, um, especially from social media, we get lucky in the sense that we're at a lot of events. So you see the people that are very active at Georgia Tech. In fact, I think it was two, two graduations ago, we uh, basically just talk to this girl because we see her everywhere and we're like we have seen you everywhere tell us your Georgia Tech story and she ended up having like a really really good one she was involved with Ramblin' Rec Club and she was involved with all sorts of stuff had gone to Africa and and, and done all, all sorts of really fantastic things during her college career and we are blessed at Georgia Tech in the sense that so many of these students are doing uh, not just fantastic research but are doing many things outside of the classroom outside of just their academic purview and are broadening their horizons so we we tend to, when we see those people uh, early on in their college career, just kind of give them a heads up that, hey, when are you graduating? And then we keep a <laughs> mental note uh, of when that might be. In fact, I have a list at my desk right now with about four of them for this for this upcoming commencement. And uh, and to see if, even if it's not something that is a full video, maybe we just talk to them. Uh, one thing that we didn't mention in the commencement live is sometimes we'll do live interviews with people and we'll just ask them for pictures and we'll do what's called a voiceover, a VO. So we run the pictures on the big board while we're talking to him live and doing the interview for about 30, 45 seconds to a minute. And that also kind of is a different type of content feature that happens in the live that we can feature them during commencement, but maybe not necessarily as social content as well. And, and some of these themes, they are 
coming out on their own. That we're not always saying this is a theme we're looking for. We're not looking for students who were international and came over and, and had to learn English. But sometimes you're like, wow, we got three applicants that all said that. So by just letting them have that box to put whatever they want in there, some themes we've been very lucky have just emerged throughout the year or the semester for each ceremony. And we may have 24 submissions, but there's going to be some duds in there too. Oh, yeah. <laughs> some of them, they, they just yeah, don't. Yeah, we never do them all. Yeah. And that's, I mean, yeah. And that's also just because we wouldn't have the capacity, even if we there's too many others that pop up other places, but it's a really good starting point. Another thing that we kind of didn't mention in here was we're all in our central communications office, but we will work with communicators in colleges and schools to try to make sure we're getting a good representation. So again, we're not going to do a story on every single school because that would be crazy, but we will at least try to make sure that we're getting a good diversity of majors and different types of you know backgrounds, geographic backgrounds, that kind of thing. So sometimes we may be like, we don't have anybody from liberal arts this semester. And we will go do some digging, either in Serena's RCP list or through contacts on campus to make sure that we're covering all our areas. Yeah, and if there is an advantage of having seven commencements in an academic year, it's that you can fit in uh, stories from just about everywhere on campus over yeah. the course of those seven. And that is always the goal because everybody's always trying to take every single box in higher ed. That's right. <laughs> Um, so we're out of time for today, but I think this has been an amazing discussion. Thank you so much to our guests, Kristen Bailey, Serena Wallace, and Bryce Zimmerman. And thanks as always to our program sponsor, PRSA's Counselors to Higher Education. Don't forget to follow and engage with us on Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. We appreciate you joining us for this special edition of Higher Ed Live. Have a good day. Thanks Thank for having you. us.